Baker to uh, to have uh, Nick Jensen with us uh, this evening. I've known Nick uh, uh, for a number of years. Uh, he's been uh, in in several capacities at uh, at CNPS, and uh, now he's kind of at the, uh, the the what I'll call the top rung of the CNPS. Uh, uh, staff list as the CNPS conservation program director, one of the uh, the really key positions in the organization. Uh, he's supervising a team of conservation professionals and oversees the organization's advocacy uh, program statewide. Uh, he also uh, uh, honchos the litigation uh, that CNPS uh, engages in and uh, participates in coalitions of environmental organizations and media relations. So he's he's got his hands in a lot of different pies. Uh, he has a, a bachelor's in environmental horticulture from UC Davis and recently completed a PhD in botany at the California Botanic Garden Claremont Graduate University. Uh, and as a graduate student, he produced an immense product which is the first flora of the Tejon Ranch, which is California's largest contiguous piece of private land. Uh, he, he's also studied the evolutionary patterns in perennial Streptanthus. And some of the positions he's been in previously at CNPS are vegetation program assistant, and then was the rare plant program director. And he's also worked for other organizations as a botanist for the Forest Service, uh, Chicago Botanic Garden and done private consulting and also taught. So it's with great pleasure that uh, I turn the meeting over to uh, Nick to talk about Moloch Luyuk, which we often knew as uh, Walker Ridge. Uh, it that's it's it's hopefully going to be named for the indigenous name, uh, and uh, you know. You know, we have our our own land is the Coast Miwok, and the the Moloch Luigit is in the Patwin uh, language, as I understand it. So, with that, Nick, uh, My, uh, Dave. Oh, I'm you... sorry. Paul, Paul, yes, Paul. Paul, oh. Paul De Silva is the board member and head of our uh, uh, scholarship committee, and we have an. He is in a position to tell us who has been awarded scholarships by the by the chapter. Uh, so, so one of the things we want to make sure that we do is continue to have people such as Nick uh, getting their degrees and able to study and complete their research. And so a number of years ago, there was concern that uh, there wasn't enough uh, support being given to graduate students in botany. And uh, our chapter, along with several other chapters, have tried to assist um, uh, students uh, at least a little bit in that regard. So for over, uh, I'm trying to think of whether it's between 10, it's over 10 years, maybe 15 years now, we've had a scholarship program and uh, to a large extent, this is made possible by bequests from two uh, former members, uh, Ken Howard and, and Joe Cohn. And so uh, it's with great pleasure that uh, I announce on behalf of the scholarship committee of our chapter that uh, we are awarding two uh, scholarships this year. Uh, one goes to Miranda Mellon of UC Santa Cruz for the project Seed Bank and Germination Behavior of an Invading Member of the Asteraceae, Detrichia graviolens. As we know, uh, weeds and invasive species are, are great threats to our flora. And the other goes to Maria Velasquez of Sonoma State University for the project uh, Does Community Assembly determine restoration success and persistence of remnant kelp forests. Uh, we realize that this is an underwater uh, uh, photosynthetic uh, uh, group of, of organisms, uh, not strictly plants, but uh, they, the, the kelp forests uh, play a tremendously important part uh, in our local ecology. So we wish both of our awardees the best of success in their projects, and uh, we hope that uh, we'll be able to continue this program for many years to come. Thank you so much uh, to, to Dick and, and, and Dave for giving this opportunity. Thank you, Paul. What was the, is the, thanks, Paul. Um, really good to hear about, um, about uh, chapters continuing to support uh, graduate education and graduate research. It's really, I think it's a wonderful thing uh, that, that 
I think a number of our chapters do. I was the recipient not of a Marin chapter grant, but uh, but of several chapters in Southern California's grants when I was a grad student, and it, it helped out a lot, and it means a lot actually to to those students. So I'm glad you're doing the chapter is doing that. It's it's always a a pleasure to to spend the evening um, with one of our chapters, and and good to see some some very some familiar friends and 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 names on the screen. Um, and so so I'm just gonna do a um, bit of a, I mean, it's a it's a tour of a place that I'm sure many of, of you have actually been. Um, it's uh, it's a, um, the area that we we used to call Walker Ridge is a place that uh, that people, students of botany and just appreciate, people who appreciate the flora of California have, have been going to for a long time. Um, and I wanted to say that I am um, neither the first person to, to visit you know, Molokla Yoke, as we're as as its new name is, um, and um, and I'm not the first person either to fight for its conservation. And so, um, I see myself as someone who's just kind of um, uh, the torch has been, you know, essentially, you know, passed to me in a way through my professional um, uh, work here at CNPS and. Um, Hoping that that you know that that we can start transitioning this conversation. Oh, okay, I'm not going to do no spoiler alerts. No spoiler alerts yet. So, or spoil. I was just spoiler alerted myself. No spoilers. So, I'm going to start sharing my screen and um, go through some slides that I've put together. And and um, always happy to answer questions at the end, since I think that's the easiest thing to do, given that it it'll be um, hard for me to manage chat while we're, while I'm talking. But here. I go with sharing and I'll make this full screen. And I think this is looking good. So this, the title of this talk is this is, is a monumental opportunity. Um, and we'll get, I'll get to the end why I think that's a good title. And there's my contact information should you um, uh, want to send me messages after, after the fact. But just this is a quick outline of my talk. A um, little bit of background on, or not, maybe not more than a little bit of background on the botanical significance of Molokla Yoke. Um, there's the um, there's the pronunciation of this uh, this Putwin name, which is Molokla Yoke. Uh, I probably still Molokla Yoke. I still don't say it well. Probably I'm still not perfect, but I'm getting better. Uh, means Condor Ridge, which is a really actually a neat name when you think about it for a place where um, a, you know this prominent ridge that uh, condors, that are California condors, used to fly over and hopefully one day again will. And um, like I said, this is a, a place that we, um, we used to know as, as Walker Ridge. And I think it's uh, appropriate for it to, re to rename it to honor the, the Native American um, uh, culture, which is still very much active in the, in the region. I'll talk a little bit about threats and advocate history of advocacy. And then uh, toward, and then the last part of the talk will be hopefully the real positive piece where we we uh, will talk about the or I will talk about ways that 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 this land could become conserved and and managed a little bit better. So um, the reason you know for the 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 renaming is that these are these are the ancestral lands um, of the Yochadehi Winton Nation. Um, these are, um, you know, members of the tribe, and the tribe itself is our partner um, in this. And they are in maybe we're we're their partner. They really are leading this effort. Uh, they're leading the the effort to conserve and to to appropriately co-management co-manage uh, Molokai Oak uh, going forward. And so this is just my uh, um, with and we have deep appreciation, deep respect for the tribe. So. Here is, um, oh, I clicked too many times. So um, Molokli Oak is located partially in Calusa here in, and also in uh, partially in, um, did I go too, many, too far? I did not, okay. Partially in Calusa and partially in Lake County. Um, if uh, I see like, we, I don't, didn't quite make a map that had Marin County in there, but not too far off the screen there. Um, it's, you know, about a, from Sacramento, you can be on Molokli you know, driving up Walker Ridge Road. It's still Walker Ridge Road. Um, probably about an hour and a half from Sacramento. I bet it's not too much more than an hour and a half from, from you all in, in Marin County. Maybe it's a little bit longer. I actually don't know. Maybe two hours. Uh, just east of Clear Lake, north of Lake Berryessa. And um, 
the land management, the, the ownership um, is large is largely with a, a couple of small in holdings, Bureau of Land Management, so federal government land. Uh, this is land that, um, well, the, the greater um, Moloch Loyok, uh, the ridge, uh, is, uh, is uh, a little piece of it. You know, a few thousand acres is already in the National Monument. I'll zoom in on this in a second. But it's essentially abuts the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument, which is a monument created by, uh, by President Obama. I think it was the right date was 2015. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. Um, there's, um, there's a, there, it's, it's largely just regular old BLM land. There's a couple of areas of critical environmental concern inside and adjacent to the land, which have special management designations. And that's uh, the acronym ACEC that you'll see sometimes on maps or in, in conservation literature. And then there's some other conservation lands, including private land holdings that are, that are conserved adjacent to Moloch Leoch. Zooming in a little bit more, um, you'll see this area. Um, I would usually, if we weren't on Zoom, I would probably ask questions of the audience and say, like, how many people have been to Bear Valley? You know, Bear Valley of Calusa County, which is a just a very famous place for wildflowers. It really is part and parcel with Moloch Leoch. Um, the streams, the watersheds that, that emanate from, um, from Moloch Leoak connect to the, these very famous wildflower fields of Bear Valley. Um, it's, um, it's a pretty, you know, pretty, um, well, anyway, so a couple things to note from this map. Uh, there is the county line running down the center. You all, I think, can see my cursor as I go down the screen. Um, a, a portion of uh, Moloch Leoch, oh, this is the county line actually right here. A portion of Moloch Leoch is already in the National Monument. That's this kind of where, I, where I, I'm hovering over right now. And the rest of this is what we seek to add to the National Monument. Uh, it's from Bear Valley, around 1,300 feet in elevation, all the way up to Cold Spring Mountain, which is in the, the highest point of the ridge is about uh, 3,500 feet in elevation. So there's a significant um, you know, vertical relief between those two spots. And since I mentioned the beauty of, of Bear Valley, I just wanted to, to you know, this is our, uh, I guess the appetizer, the palate, clen palate cleanser before we get into the, the, the heart of this talk, which is just some pretty wildflower photos. Uh, a couple of these are, are from just uh, a couple weeks ago of, of the beautiful wildflower displays, you know, like, uh, like cream cups covering as far as the eye can see from from Bear Valley, just fabulous place, um, you know, and just all kinds of beautiful wildflowers. Those are that's your. Um, we can't get through get do a CN, I can't do a CMPS talk without pretty wildflower photos, can I? That would be, that would just be inappropriate. So uh, the next couple of slides I'm going to address, uh, or I'm going to you know cover are kind of addressing um, some of the reasons why Moloch um, well, well I consider Moloch special. I mean it's special by any means, but I there's some some hyp hypothetical reasons why that contribute to the diversity there. And by special I mean really diverse and spectacular in so many different ways. Um, this is a you know if you're familiar with kind of the eco regions of California. This is an area that is in what we call the inner North Coast ranges, but you know, like like many other many places in California, Moloch Leoch kind of rests at a you know kind of a junction where there are, are influences from other areas, which lends to it being a bit of a melting pot. And by that I mean there is it's a bit of a connection point between the Bay Area and and the more coastal habitats. And there are there are influences from the Central Valley. And there's definitely influences from the north as well. So, you know, this is a you know a zone of ecological convergence in a way. Not the only one in the state. We all we all know that there are a lot of these in the state, but this is certainly a um, a one of those. Um, the by that I'm saying also that the red is the is Moloch Leoch in the center, and then you see some of the Jepson uh, Jepson Manual ecoregions there surrounding it and 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 showing their context. Um, geologically speaking. This is definitely a, a, a neat place. Um, particularly speaking, just naming the, I'm not a geologist. I would do geology a disservice by talking too much about it in this talk, but um, there's a couple of trends that are important. Uh, towards the southern end of Moloch Leoch, we have uh, non-serpentine uh, influence uh, soils and habitats. And to the more to the north, you transition to serpentine. 
if you don't know what serpentine is, that's okay. I have a few slides on serpentine because um, that's part of uh, anyone's CMPS education is to, is to learn about and talk about and learn to love serpentine habitats because they are just wonderful habitats for plants. Both of these contribute to the diversity of Molochleo because there are some plants that, that occur on serpentine and some that don't uh, and vice versa. So just to talk about serpentine a little bit. Um, serpentinite is our state rock. Um, you can see here on, in the photo, um, some really good examples of, of uh, serpentinite. Um, it's, a, it's a rock that is formed uh, through metamorphic processes, processes. So meaning it's like heated and lots of heat and a lot of pressure. Um, it's essentially metamorphous oceanic crust uh, with all kinds of interesting um, nutrients and minerals that, that make for some challenges to some plants. Um, and then serpentinite, once it becomes uh, soil, it's broken down a bit and becomes, you know, um, habitat for plants, for plant roots. It, is, it becomes, it, we use the term serpentine. So you might've heard serpentine habitats or serpentine soil. So that's where that, um, those, that, that transformation happens, at least um, linguistically or you know, speaking, I guess. And where does it occur? So, I mean, uh, you, you all are, uh, presumably most of you are in uh, Marin County or if you, unless you're visiting the, the Marin County chapter uh, virtually tonight, but it, most of you in, in Marin County are probably not too far away from serpentine habitat and, and serpentinite rocks. Um, generally though in the state, this is the, these are um, habitats and, and soils um, are, uh, are occur north of, of Santa Barbara, not much more, not much farther to the south than that. And then they kind of ring the central valley. So the, the generally speaking in foothill habitats, but you can see there's, there's tons and tons of, of um, of serpentine habitats in the coast ranges. Probably the, the kind of the most extensive outcrops of serpentine are in the Klamath Range up here in the kind of the far northern portion of the state. Uh, and then you can see on the map, if you squint a little bit, the red dot over blue, uh, which is uh, which is Moloch Layuk. And um, you know, Steve Edwards, who was a long time, who's a long time, uh, I think, uh, director of the Tilden Botanic Garden um, and lover of this area, called it one of the most important serpentine areas on earth. I'm not going to argue with Mr. Edwards at all. I think he's probably right. It is a very, very special place for serpentine habitats. And why serpentine? Why do we care so much? Well, it has unique physical and chemical properties. I like to say it is high in a lot of the things that plants don't need a lot of and low in some of the, some of the nutrients that plants do need a lot of. By that, I mean pretty low in calcium, low in those three um, letters that appear on the bag of, of fertilizers that you buy at your nursery, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, uh, high in things like magnesium, high in certain heavy metals like chromium and, um, and nickel. And then when this rock, um, look at the, you know, this is one of my friends, Strep Streptanthus down there growing straight out of, uh, you know, essentially straight out of, uh, of serpentine habit, serpentine rock um, or serpentine soil, um, it often creates a very thin topsoil. And so what this equates to is challenging growing conditions that certain plants, certain lineages of plants, certain species have been able to colonize over time. Some of them have separated out from their, you know, from their, their um, the species from which they or originated and become species of their own through the process of selection and evolution. Not gonna, this is not gonna become an evolution talk, although, and because you don't want me giving that talk anyway, probably after being out of grad school a few years, I've forgotten so many things. But the, the truth is that there are a lot of plants that grow exclusively on serpentine. And this is our serpentine endemic flora. There's a, this is a photo of, uh, from the top of Moloch Layok, where you see some pretty, um, uh, this is from, from Cold Spring Mountain or pretty darn close to it, um, where you see this, these very kind of open habitats uh, where you're not going to find a lot of invasive plants. And what's, what has resulted in, you know, the, the, from the process, this, this very well um, developed flora on serpentine habitats, lots and lots of rare plants, many endemic species, endemic, you know, if you're not, you're new to the botany game, uh, endemic just means that it doesn't grow anywhere else. So it can be, you can have a plant that's endemic to Marin County, or you could have a plant that's endemic to a certain type of habitat. And there, are, so, um, you know, 
hundreds and hundreds of species in California are, are found um, exclusively or they're tolerators of serpentine habitats. So, and so 14% of our state endemics are serpentine endemic, which is, you know, just, so you, you, if you are a botanist, in California, especially if you're um, you know, north of Santa Barbara, I suppose, you learn to love serpentine habitats. So I, I talked about a, a couple of factors, you know, like the, well, I, in one of the slides, I talked about elevation range. I talked about, um, um, you know, the, the, its place in, on Earth, uh, molecular yolks geology. And a lot of this is, 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 is equating to on the ground when you're, when you're out there and you're looking at the place in a diversity of habitats. And those habit, each of those habitats contains different species and different dominant species, different, you know, just a lot of different diversity. And so you have just a tremendous amount of, of um, different habitats on the, on the ridge, various forms of chaparral. So you can see, you know, uh, you know the, if you're not familiar with chaparral, those are these, the shrub dominated habitats, which you find in so many foothill locations in California with plants like Mies and manzanita and ceanothus, uh, to primarily to well, not necessarily always on 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 Molokoi, but there are oak woodlands to the south. So you know the blue oak woodlands to the southern part of the ridge. There is pine woodlands and forests. There is extensive forests of McNabb cypress. Um, prior to some of the recent fires. This was uh, called the location of the largest McNab cypress or Hesperos cyperus McNabiana um, forest on earth. That's a, you know, it's a California, you know, like a conifer that, that can grow on serpentine habitats. And so, you know, some of this, as, as, as the case in many parts of California, some of these areas have burned on some of the habitats on Molokoi have burned, so it's no longer a forest, but you know, it's this, uh, it, it will li the, likely someday, if there aren't more fires in quick su succession, we will have, uh, once again, the, the largest McNabb's cypress forest um, on, on the planet. Um, lots of different serpentine habitats, including meadows. So there's a lot of water on Molokoi Oak. So you have uh, serpentine areas that are mesic, or you have a lot of water, which is neat. Um, and then there's xeric habitats that are serpentine influenced. So where you see things like this is a snow mountain buckwheat here. Um, and um, they are, these are areas where, where the pretty much the only um, plants you're gonna find are really cool native ones, you know, almost exclusively. So just a lot of different habitats. And then um, these are you know, some photos from, from uh, past fires on Molokoi Oak. You know, we, we talk a lot about fire as a, uh, you know, it depends on where you are, right? So if you're on Molokoi Oak where there's no, um, no houses, um, it's not such a bad thing for fire to occur there because that um, um, the, the plants have met most of the flora of California it has, has grown up with fire, it's adapted to fire. Uh, and so, there's a lot of beauty that comes from, from fire, including plants like uh, golden eardrops or Arendorferia chrysantha. I used to know it as Dicentra chrysantha that only really comes out after fire. And so this is a, a summary of, of, of some of the diversity there. So, you know, 490 plant taxa, by taxa I mean species, subspecies, varieties, occur on Molokoi, which is a huge amount of diversity. Uh, that's native ta plant taxa. So, there are about 65, 6,600 native plant taxa, you know, native plants in the entire state of California. And I should have done the calculation and I'm not gonna attempt to do this calculation in my head, but just on, on 20,000 acres, you have, um, you know, what is it? One twelfth of, the, of the, the flora of California, which is pretty, that's a lot. And this relates to, you know, some of the factors I already talked about, the geology the ecoregional context, the, the topography. So, you know, so if this were just a 20,000 acres of flat ground, um, there wouldn't be as much diversity because there just wouldn't be as many niches and, and nooks and essentially nooks and crannies for, um, for various uh, species to occur. Uh, and then, you know, I guess like, you know, the, the, the end of it is just really the end of the slot, the last bullet point there. It's just really, we're just really talking about heter habitat heterogeneity. All of these things um, contribute to there being, you know, various places for various plants to occur. And that's why, you know, in a lot of ways, we have such tremendous diversity there. 
Now, many of us, uh, many, you know, include, I'll probably include many of you in this list, friends of CNPS, CNPS members, a lot of us get involved in, in, um, in, C, in CNPS because we've at some point or another fell in love with rare plants, plants like our serpentine milkweed. That's a really, really beautiful plant, clearly. Um, Molokley Oak has more than 30 plants ranked by our native plant, by, the, by us, by the Native Plant Society, by our rare plant program as rare at some level. Uh, it's probably actually closer to 40. It might actually be 40. 13 of those are our 1Bs, or the globally rare plants, the plants that are rare from a global perspective. And this also, you know, the, the rare plant diversity mimics the overall plant diversity in that you have, that's, this is a lot of rare plants in a relatively small area. I think we're really close to right 40 rare plants at this point in time. Um, in his introduction, David mentioned that I did a flora of Tejon Ranch uh, as part of my graduate education. That's 270,000 acres. And I think we were, at, by the time I was done with that work, we we're pushing 60 rare plants. So think about 60 rare plants on 270,000 acres. And Tejon Ranch is a fabulous place for, place for plant diversity. On Molokley Oak, 40 rare plants on 20,000 acres. So this, this, is a, this is like a rare plant hotspot by any means. And because it's not just about plants, there's a lot of, of animal diversity as well. And I'm not really qualified to talk about animals, but there are a lot of animals and, and animal diversity. And it's, a, it's an important place. Uh, that is to say, this is an important place, not just because of us plant people care about plants, but because this is a, a habitat that is connected to other habitats. There are, there are creatures big and small that use this, this area and call it home. And then just, you know, just looking at um, recreational opportunities because that is, you know, something that us uh, human people tend to like. Um, our intercoast ranges are not the easiest place to gain access to, to really cool habitats and, and places for recreation. Um, the um, Walker Ridge Road, the road that tra traverses up Molok Layuk is a, is a road that is, um, if you were very careful, I suppose you could travel, you could use, you could get a regular old passenger car and drive up it. You, you might have to take it slow. It might be a little bit bumpy. Um, you might need to tighten the nuts and bolts after you do it, but you could do it. There aren't that many roads like that in the intercoast ranges. And if you have something like a Subaru or something like that, you're probably just fine with a little bit of clearance and all wheel drive. So this is a place where there is tremendous opportunities for things like all these things, you know, you know, hiking and camping and bird watching and all those those good things. So this is a really a, a place where there are, there are ample opportunities to expand and, and appreciate, expand recreation and, appre and appreciate this place. All right, so I'm a conservation person. Why, you know, why do we care about conserving this place? Well, um, and this is, I'll give my, you know, my, my disclaimer on, on, on renewable energy. We abs, yeah, do we need renewable energy? Absolutely. This is, uh, it is, it is part of our survival. It's part of our planet's survival. It's a part of the survival of, uh, important for the survival of all the plants and animals that call this place home. However, not all places that have been proposed for renewable energy are appropriate for that. And this is one of one such place. Uh, the California Energy Commission has noted that it has pretty low energy generation capacity. So this is a pretty low, um, low area for, for, renewable, for wind energy generation. And that might have uh, played a role in the fact that there have been um, a number of proposals for this area to be developed for commercial scale wind energy uh, generation and they've all faltered. And so um, this is to say, you know, renewable energy, yes, but the right places, yes, too. And this is just not one of those places. And also this is a place that needs better, like, so shifting away from renewable energy and the threat, um, there are ongoing threats. Uh, you see a bit of, um, this is, you know, that's me walking up one of these, um, one of these, I would say, scars on the landscape. Um, there are many illegal OHV, so off-highway vehicle trails on Molokloi Oak that have been created um, largely, not largely, but some of them have been created essentially as a result of fire suppression activities. 
So I think this is probably familiar to many people who have been paying attention in California. We have big wildfires. We try to stop them. Sometimes that stopping stoppage of fire works. Sometimes it doesn't. One of the tools that we use are bulldozers and, and hand lines. And if those, those areas are not repaired properly, then what was once a fire break uh, is can become an OHV trail. So this is not to say that that um, some OHV recreation is not um, might not be appropriate on uh, Moloklyuk. It is saying I am saying though, however, that better management and restoration and repair is necessary. So I'm um, talking a little bit of, like so so transition a little bit about what's going on at Moloklyuk. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the conservation actions that have been taking place on there for literally for decades. Um, CMPS and other organizations have been um, advocating for the, the full and complete, you know, the complete conservation of Moloklyuk Oak um, long before we were calling it Moloklyuk, Oak, let me tell you. Uh, probably before I was, you know, doing professional botany work, um, this, this, was, this has been happening. Um, uh, those previous proposals have been kind of fought at various levels and, and beaten back. Um, and then CMPS, uh, our wonderful organization here, actually has had position, petitioned um, twice, both in 2005 and 2011, that the entirety of the area be made an area of critical environmental concern uh, uh, through a petition process to the BLM, that it hasn't happened. Um, but that was an attempt to use a, an administrative remedy to solve the problem of a development and get management back on the right right foot on Moloklyuk. Um, that's still, I suppose, we still could ask for them to make it an ACEC or an area of critical environmental concern, but at the same time, um, uh, we have, uh, I guess, bigger plans. Um, so we, we have um, uh, our, the current, I would say, phase of advocacy on, on Molokliuk started in around 2019 in response to uh, the, the la hopefully what will be the last proposal to develop wind, wind um, energy on this on the site. Uh, we did we went we produced a website and had a petition with more than 5,000 signatures to the BLM webinars like this and presentations. Uh, we took people up in the air to see the place from above, including the, you know, elected officials from Lake County, uh, produced a bunch of education materials and did a bunch of advocacy. Um, that closed, oh, the goals of this, of course, the goals, um, get ahead of myself, no wind development on Molokla Yolk, um, and of course, advocating for wind, wind and other forms of renewable energy development where they are appropriate, where they are going to be minimally um, impactful on the environment. Um, conserve the area in, in perpetuity and, and better management, including tribal co-management. Those are the goals. That um, the first phase of, of Molokloyo conservation that I was involved in from you know those first couple of years, 19, uh, 19, 2019 to 2021, um, I, th I suppose kind of ended when um, when we shifted to a Washington DC based strategy. And we have a wonderful coalition. Many, many groups are, are involved. Um, too many to name, too many to put on a screen. But we have wonderful um, you know, colleagues and, and, and confidants in, in this effort. And um, we have, all, in that, and that translated to having wonderful um, support in Washington, D.C. with the introduction of a, of, of a bill, uh, HR, or House Resolution 6366 by, um, by Congressman John Garamendi and, and Mike Thompson, which was followed up by a Senate bill called S4080, uh, authored by um, Alex Padilla and Diane Feinstein, known collectively as the, or you know, just as the Darius Snow Mountain National Monument Expansion Act. This was, you know, pretty, pretty, very, very exciting for us. Um, the bill itself, and we'll talk a little bit more about the intricacies, the politics and intricacies of this as I as I go along. Um, it does a few things. So this, this legislation does, renames uh, Walker Ridge to Molokliuk. It adds 4,000 acres of land uh, in, in Lake County uh, to, to the National Monument. See that this map shows the, the piece that's, that's added to the National Monument. Um, 
it includes a provision for tribal co-management and 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 uh, dictates that there needs to be a, a monument man management plan drafted. Now, you're probably wondering, what, what about Calusa County? Well, Calusa County is, um, it's not politically favorable uh, at this point in time for things like um, adding adding land to national monuments. So the the decision um, when the congressmen, the Congress, Congress people, sorry about that, were introducing this legislation was to um, to to only add the Lake County portion to Molokai Oak, which um, would have made um, any future development a lot more uh, more challenging. Uh, we've uh, had a lot of great support for um, for this uh, this effort, uh, including uh, many environmental organizations, the Yotudehi Winton Nation, of course, those are our key partners, uh, some boards of supervisors, that's, that's what BOS is, uh, from Lake and Yolo County, elected officials, and many others, thousands and thousands of people. We made great progress. And in fact, there was a time at the end of last year or towards the end of last year that we thought we might actually be able to get this thing passed. It, it ended up not happening. Um, there, were, uh, there was a hearing in, in the, the House of House, a really, really great hearing where, where there was testimony from BLM and testimony from tribal chairman of the tribal chairman of the Yotadei Winton Nation um, that the bill passed out of the House as part of the National um, Defense Authorization Act. It even got a hearing in the Senate, a markup in the Senate and, and in the Senate Committee of, of Energy and Natural Resources and passed unanimously. Um, but there were politics at play, I guess, you know, big surprise, right? Um, and um, when it looked like it wasn't going to happen, the, the, our um, congressional champions um, requested um, a pivot to a national monument. So this is where um, you know we it, you know it's been interesting. It even gets more interesting. So uh, if you're many of you are probably familiar with national monuments, um, which are made possible that by the Antiquities Act, uh, signed into law by Theodore Roosevelt, which allows the president or Congress to preserve historic landmarks, historic and prehistoric structures, and other objects of historic or scientific interest. Um, it's been used, uh, I guess, more than a, uh, used uh, more than 130 times, I suppose, since there's just been a couple more added by the Biden, Biden administration. And these can be large in nature or small. I think the smallest national monument is less than an acre, and the largest ones are hundreds of thousands of, maybe even millions. Some of the marine national monuments could be millions of acres in, in, in size. Uh, and so, uh, this is the tool we we want to use to conserve the entirety of Molokai. Uh, just a little uh, teaser at this point in time. There are um, numerous um, national monument campaigns at various uh, uh, stages of their development in in the state, um, and uh, including ones basically all over the state. I would say is what's what's happening. So there, this is a has emerged as a key management tool for or, or sorry, key conservation tool for um, for the federal government, the president to use to, to save very, very special places in the state. Um, at this point in time, um, I don't know, I don't make this, this call and who knows this could be, um, uh, I could be proven wrong, I hope I'm not, but, but, but from what we hear, Molokai Oak is the top of the list for California National Monuments that will, that if the president starts, um, is I drift to um, this, our, our, our beloved state here, Molokai Oak is likely to be the first or one of the first to be, um, to be designated using the Antiquities Act. Um, one, note, one thing to note, our legislation from last year, pretty much the same, um, same authors, um, different, different bill numbers has been reintroduced, which was a necessary step. Uh, the administration, Biden administration likes to have legislation, although it's not um, absolutely, um, I don't think it's absolutely necessary by law. You could take action without there being a bill, but that's that's it's a good thing that there is. Um, that was introduced, I think, last month, or maybe it was in March. Time flies. Um, but a couple of things that are happening that that or that are required is what's called an object of interest study if for the for monument um, designations. That kind of uh, is the is essentially the, the the cultural and scientific justification. Uh, for the president to act and, and make a make this uh, proclamation, 
um, it's a uh, it's now we've uh, here at uh, my my program has been involved in a in a couple of these. Um, glad to have wonderful staff to help out with some of these and help me out with these. Um, and these are these are huge and and very um, well scrutinized documents. These objects of interest studies. And then the other thing that is uh, in a critical piece is a support book. So uh, there has to be justification of why. Um, uh, why a place like Molokaliuk should be um, the object of uh, of a um, of an Antiquities Act designation, using you know it's making a national monument, and one of those things that you know so so you have justification of why it's a special place and why it's important, and then um, a showing of support from the community and from environmental groups and elected officials and all those things. So um, I'll, I will share with you that 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 uh, that you all can play a role here in signing the petition to make this place a um, a national monument, and um, uh, each each signature is once I think a important step forward towards making this happen. Okay, I just I I I, I telegraphed what I was going to say. Um, so this is uh, so this is where we are at this point in time. So we have a we we have I think pretty much everything or nearly everything in place to make this happen. Um, we but we do need your help, so everyone's help. So I've included, and I can include it in the chat. That's one of the nice things about Zoom talks is I can um, post some links there in the chat so that you can get online and, and sign the petition. Um, of course, um, one of the things that, that has happened because there is legislation is our, our House members, some of them will be, um, uh, will will sign on to so formally support the legislation. And so if you live in an area, I can, um, uh, you can look on congress.gov and, and see who has actually signed on as, as uh, supporters of the legislation. Um, and if the, those are your um, elected officials, please thank them. Um, of course, spreading the word is, is something we can we would love to have you do if you have you know, chapter newsletters or you're aligned with other organizations that might want to support this. We need one and we need one and all to support it. And then and if you're so inclined, you could you know, even send your own letter of support. And if you want to, you know, um, do so to the the Biden administration. That would be wonderful as well. But uh, so this is um, you know I would love for this also to turn into a a fruitful discussion. I know I've only talked for about uh, you know forty or so minutes here, um, which is usually not my um, brevity is usually not my strength. But I've given us an, a, a lot of time to, uh, to to for you all to ask questions and. Um, I think I will go off of those. That's uh, so a couple of things, important things. My email address here, and also expandbariessa.org. That's our website, our coalition website. That I um, I can actually put that in the chat too so for you folks to see. Um, all right. Okay. So questions from the chat, or folks can raise their hand. Maybe I should stop sharing my screen then. Nick, there are a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Nita Winters uh, first asks, how can we get access to Bear Valley these days? Uh, Bear Valley, oh God, well, there's the easy question, the easy answer to that question, which is there's Bear Valley Road that is open to the public as public road, pretty well maintained, actually really well maintained. But if one were to want to, to get actually access to off of the road, there is, and I, there is, I don't remember the name of the landowner who opens up during wildflower season their land for people to, and they even, have, I think they have a donation box or something like that, where you can actually go take a stroll in the field to wildflowers. And then whether or not there are any tours that get access onto the Bear Valley land, I'm not sure, but I do know that you can drive through Bear Valley and then you also can access at least one parcel um, during wildfire season. And Nita then, also asks about the, uh, the the national monument status and its benefits. She says, given that national monuments still allow mining and grazing, et cetera, on these public lands, what's the benefit of having this additional land designation as a national monument? What kind yeah. of activity is prevented by this designation? So a couple of things. Well, specific to Molokoyok, um, it would, this would, 
this would preclude renewable energy development. So this would there would no longer be the the threat of industrial scale um, energy generation there. And and by that I, is I mean that we're the last proposal had 42 turbines that were like two or 300 feet tall and 2,000 acres of direct habitat loss and stuff like that. So that would be a bad that would that would that would stop. Now we. Our, one of the main things we're aiming for with this campaign also is that through the designation that there would be a requirement of the, the Bureau of Land Management, the federal government to, um, to entertain requests for co-management and tribal management, which is a really, really spectacular thing. It's not my, obviously it's not my area of, um, of expertise, but this is, you know, uh, not that I want to, you know, throw the, the, the word historic around too much, but this is something that is um, as part of a national monument campaign. This is the, the most, I think, well-developed idea of its kind, such that um, that um, you know our, our Native American advocates for this land are, are really uh, for this for this campaign are thrilled. Um, and then the hope also, a few other things, would be that um, I don't believe that there's any active um, uh, mining. Um, mining claims on this land. So mining would not be an issue. And then, um, and I'm not sure about grazing either. I don't think I've never seen a, a grazing, a non-native uh, grazing animal out there. So I'm not sure that those are, are two huge issues, but um, one of the things that we're hoping for is, is that, that this, this area would get managed in, um, uh, in concert with the rest of the National Monument. And that, that also having this area as part of the National Monument could actually open it up to having uh, uh, a more federal funding. I don't know if that's true, that definitely could happen. And just uh, a, a, little bit, uh, uh, a little bit better, a better management is really important and would spur that into action. So, um, so there's a lot of good things about this, about adding this piece to the National Monument, I, I suppose, and although, I agree with Nita that um, that it's not perfect. Monuments are not perfect. They're not not, not the you know not uh, everything from a conservation perspective. But this is uh, this would be a, a pretty wonderful thing from uh, from the perspective of Moloch Yuk. Is is there any possibility of a bipartisan congressional solution? Um, I don't know if there's. I don't know if it's there's I don't know if it's it's impossible, although um, our you know I'm not and I'm not a you know a DC lobbyist or anything, but we do work with with organizations that that are that employ those folks, and it's very very low likelihood. Last year we had a chance. Um, I think with the current makeup of the House, I think it's really and I think it's very unlikely. Um, and very unlikely is probably optimistic, unfortunately. It's, it's sad that that's where we are because I you know, would love to think of, of um, uh, something like this as not really political, but I guess it is. Yeah. Well, if, if there are any other questions that uh, folks want to ask, feel free to uh, raise your hand and... Uh... Oh, go ahead, Carolyn. Carolyn, you need to unmute. Okay, here we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, my question has to do with the portion of it, of the site that is uh, in Calusa County. Mm -hmm. Is that what we think of as Bear Valley? Um, or is it actually up on the ridge? And, you know, what is the strategy for getting that protected as well okay so couple couple of um couple of things so bear valley is in Clusa county it is um it is under con i think i i don't want to say all of it but but i i've heard that all of it is under conservation easement already so mm -hmm. it's private land and yeah. conserved in you know uh, managed to some degree. The there is a portion of Muluk Layok, which is also in Calusa County, that is BLM land, which is um, which is what we're trying to add to the national monument in concert with 
the rest of it, which is in um, in Calusa, in in Lake County. And um, so, uh, what you're saying you know, is some some of it, some of it is up on the ridge, and it's in Lake County. I, I guess I didn't follow. Yeah, right. Yeah, so so the ridge itself. Maybe I could. I'm, I don't know. I'm not going to go back into screen sharing mode. But the ridge itself is split between kind of running, relatively speaking, north south. Split between uh, Lake to the west and and Calusa County to the east. Right. And then farther to so and that's all BLM land. The the ridge itself. If you go a little bit farther to the east, you hit the flats, which are Bear Valley private land conserved weren't with that area would not be added to the national monument because it's private land it's not managed by the federal government and so we're seeking to add about 20,000 acres to the national monument which is located maybe not 20,000 13,000 acres sorry so it's, it's it's the math is not difficult but it's hard at 8 30 on a monday i suppose um <laughs> but yeah so that's so there's a so we're adding you know so it's about 13,000 acres of land all BLM land to the national monument is 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 our desire. I don't know if I answered your question, Carolyn. I, I, yeah, I get. I think I got the gist. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, cool. Go ahead, Vernon. Vernon. Okay, so I I just wanted to add a follow-on question to Carolyn's question. What one of the most important important areas on the ridge is what Stephen Edwards called Wayne's Knoll. Is that going to be included in the National Monument? I believe so, yes. Because many of the rare plants occur on that particular, in that area. Yeah, I mean, so, so all, the entirety, you know, at the completion of this, of this endeavor, the entirety of the you know the 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 Molokai the Walker Ridge area will be part of the National Monument, um, and then of course then the next phase of this happens, which is making sure that it's managed properly, because you know as as we anyone who's I think spent a lot of time on BLM lands um, know that there are you know it's used it's not it's not wilderness you know not that we even want it to be but it's not. Not, not necessarily pristine, it can be managed a little bit better, which is, I think will be, I'll, I would much rather talk about better management and restoration and, you know, getting rid of weeds and stuff like that than be just fighting for, you know, fighting for the, the, the sur survival, I suppose. Julie Bongers has put a question into the chat having to do with grazing and uh, enhancement of wildflowers and Oh, just light, light conversation. Um, uh, and do I could, I could elaborate. Sure. I don't totally understand people, and I, I just wanted to know what you got. More than one of you might think there are people who are wildflower fanatics who believe that grazing facilitates, you know, the flower, the the bloom and the presence of wildflowers. And maybe it has to do with timing, but they're not, you know, the ones I know are not being very, they're not specifying that. I just wonder what you know and, you know, what people think, what, they, what their observations are. Yeah. I mean, I argued for, you know, if we're gonna, we're gonna graze, let's, 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 let's what did I say? Um, in East Bay Regional Parks, I once argued that we have, uh, that we be raising beer instead of cattle. But I don't know if that helps. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. No, that's, that's a very good question. Um, and I would probably only consider myself partially qualified to answer it, but um, grazing can be a tool. That's just, that is, that can be, when used properly, can be beneficial to habitats where, you know, if it's, if it's managed appropriately. In, uh, in some places, it may not be a good tool for, you know, for, it may not be a good tool no matter what, even if it is managed properly. For example, um, montane meadows in California. We probably, you know, you know, don't want, um, 
you know, want cattle munching on Darlingtonia plants or something like that, you know. So, so in some places in California where we are, where the, the habitats are, are, have the, you know, the challenge of, you know, the native, of the, our native plants have a challenge of competing with non-native plants and invasives. If managed properly, um, it can give a, you know, a little bit of a, of an advantage to some native species. Um, invernal pools also is an, is another habitat where grazing has been shown to be, you know, and I'm not a vernal pool expert, but it, I, I used to know a little bit more than I do now and about the literature. There are some areas where vernal pool habitats are those, you know, seasonal um, water depressions where, where there's a lot of great native flora and fauna have been shown to that it's really a, a, an important tool. And so I would, if there's anybody also in the audience, I know there's often a lot of knowledge here, um, um, you know, who want, anybody wants to raise their hand or, or just speak up. Um, that is to say, there are areas that probably grazing isn't a good idea and some areas where it's okay. Um, I mean, like you definitely don't want grazing in most riparian areas. So, or riparian by that, I mean like streams because that can be really bad. Yeah, Carolyn Longstreth put a comment in the chat that uh, it, grazing may benefit some types of wildflowers in grassland. Um, it's it's probably not indicated in serpentine uh, because right, yes, the damage, yes, that's true. The damage to the uh, the soft soils and compacting them. Uh, right, and then also um, I would say desert habitats are also another place where actually I think CMPS has a policy against desert grazing. Um, for good reason. Um, so uh, it really is, you know, and, and I'm not, like I say, like my full disclaimer here, not the, not, a, not a um, rangeland scientist, um, but may just know a little bit enough to be dangerous is that, that there's, um, there, there are vast areas of California where you wouldn't want to have indiscriminate grazing. And probably even those places where grazing might be appropriate need really good, um, really good management. And Ann Libin added that uh, cow pies add nutrients that allow invasion of other plants to the detriment of serpentines. Yeah. Dynamics, yeah. Making the soil richer than... Uh... Yeah, we definitely don't want um, serpentine to end up like other places in California. And, and largely speaking, you know, it's still one of the places, the habitat in California where... where um, where there are, you're going to find fewer invasive plants than in other places, which is, you know, a great reason for loving serpentine. But we're finding, for example, in Tiburon, like the Middle Ridge, where the, mm -hmm. the and maybe the, the, the prevalence of dogs and dog walking up there that uh, uh, the, the invasive seems to be getting a hold. Uh, I also wonder about nitrogen deposition too in serpentine areas. I wonder if that's a factor. Well, that may be a factor because like Ring Mountain is pretty close to 101 mm -hmm. and the prevailing winds blow over it from the West. So maybe. Yeah, and, and there's there's some of the, you know, the, I don't know if they're new, but expanding grasses like goat grass tends to, I think, be okay on serpentine, which is, I remember when I first saw goat grass at a serpentine area and it looked like it was doing it was happy I was very sad and that's a long time ago I'm sure it's continued to spread to various places so that's a, that, I guess that's a public service announcement that if you're if you're visiting serpentine areas um, or just yeah I guess if you are make sure you don't have you know seeds in your shoes yeah and then of course pick up after your dog after having heard what what David just said about dogs on in serpentine areas like on on uh, on ring mountain how is it looking this year have, have folks been out there i would love to go and see the the cow yes some some of us were just out there uh, actually with the new ring mountain docent program that we're hmm. partnering with the uh, marin county parks and open space on and it was a, a walk for the docents the hmm. new trained docents and there's it's very nice. The uh, you know the gold fields and 
uh, tiny tips. Uh, they look pretty good. It's it's not super, but it's good. And of course, it's still too early for the Tiburon Mariposa lily. Um, I have a, I have a confession to make that I've only seen it in photos. Just I. Well, you you, you need to go because it is. I know. I know. Uh, I I uh, I really. It's on my it's on my list. Yeah. Vernon added a, a comment that malt supported lease ranch in northern Wren is a good example of serpentine habitat that grazing seems to benefit. So oh, cool. probably a good example that why one size does not necessarily fit all. Yeah, this so, is this is like a lot, a lot of nuances. A lot of nuances. Uh, and you know, if I think if uh, if all of our the folks doing grazing were, you know, like you know, thinking so you know solely about habitat management, which is I think it's that's pie in the sky. It's not not going to ever happen. Then then it would be you know the there would be a self selection like oh this is not the habitat is not benefiting this so we're not going to graze here. But that's just it just it's complicated. And then uh, for for example, parks and open space uses grazing fairly extensively on uh, uh, Mount Burdell. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I've never really looked closely into the, how they how they manage it. Uh, There's that that newly described jewel flower from Mount Burdell, right? Has anybody seen that one? Somebody no. has. <laughs> oh, Doreen has. Doreen seen it? I want to go see that. I need to. I think I just need to come out to your neck of the woods. Yeah. What <laughs> one is it? Doreen discovered that. Oh, that was that was oh that was your discovery, Doreen. I it. Was, it looked just like a weed though for years before I realized that I actually could discover something new for Marendra. Since then, people have discovered other new things for Marendra. Yeah, that's yeah. a really cool plant. They're hiding in the most obvious places. Yeah, yeah. A couple of comments in the uh, in the chat. And Libin says that the, there are abundant leaves of Tiburon Mariposa lily now, uh, okay. which yeah, there there are. Uh, the the flowers will come later. And uh, Julie Barger says our plants co-evolved with ruminants. You know, lots of elk. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm so it's good to know that the Tiburon Mariposa lily is, is happily photosynthesizing right now. Hopefully I will. It's early June, okay. For many years. Yeah. yeah. It was grace when we first moved here. And, and when, yeah. when it's blooming, it's not hard to find. How it, oh, how yeah, it, it's good to know. How it evaded uh, detection until the 1970s is a real mystery. That is a, isn't that a trip? I mean, I read that not too long ago and how, like, yeah, that's right. I mean, so it's, I mean, I think your your backyard in Marin County is is not the least botanized area in the state by, by any means, yet there's still things that, I mean, the 70s is, you know, it's still a bit, I mean, I was born in 1979, so it, it was discovered before I was born, but I mean, I'm not that, I'm not old, you know, and that's like, I mean, that's that's really soon. I mean, that's really recent in a lot of ways. For something so spectacular as the, um, as the you know the Tiburon Mariposa. Yeah, it's it's hard it's hard to believe. Yeah. Private land, and you weren't allowed to go there. I went there in 1967 and never saw it. Oh. <laughs> Did find color quarters uniflora. So. Yeah. So, and I'm noting uh, Eva's. Um, yeah, this is. Yeah, so the grazing issue, it's so hard. Yeah, it's like, I think, you know, so Vernal Pools in Solano County, where there's a, a whole population of rare astragalus that was wiped out due to the grazing. And yeah, yeah, and the, the ranchers are not willing to check their cattle every day. I think that's actually, that's, that, that I think that's very true. And so, yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah, we're not gonna, we're probably, we could probably all sit down over a, a beer or some other kind of, you know, soda or whatever you you like, and talk about grazing all night. And you know the story of the Sonoma spine flower, don't you? 
I don't think I do. I would like to hear that story. Well, um, an investigation was done where they took the grazing off the Sonoma spine flower um, habitat out on Point Reyes and, mm. you know, had exclosure plots. And in the exclosure plots, the plant went extinct. But in the ones that were beef cattle grazed, the thing thrived. I mean, being a spine flower means it's not really a tasty morsel. So the seashore people have been monitoring it for many years. Huh. I don't know what they're doing now, but uh, they wow. did. Well, you would also think with keeping the oats under control with the grazing, huh, yeah. else with the invasive grasses. Yeah. If it's managed properly. I think so. But yeah, there's a lot of, anyway, there's clearly a lot of knowledge in this room, this virtual room. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, like I said, I think I need to, to come out to Ring Mountain. I would, I would be honored to go out with, with, with you, Nita. That would be, I'm going to take, I'm going to, I will take down your, your mass, your number there. Maybe well, you can teach me how to take hey. photos of plants. All right. <laughs> It's a date someday. Okay, let's do it. Well, I don't, I, I don't see any more questions. And Nick, I, I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and and for being on the front lines of uh, you know environmental conflict in in the state legislature and and even on the national stage. So, and and the I just so uh, appreciate the advice you give. Oh well. On, thank you. On, you know, I I have to say that the chapter chapter level we rely on on you heavily. For oh, your, well, thank for your good well, thank you. Counsel on 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 policy issues. So, well, thanks thanks I for many. Thank you as well. And I, you know, the thing is, I okay. So my me and my staff we're we're small in number compared to the chapters and all the work that you all do, and you should know that as well. So yes, we're we're a team together, but without the chapters, we would we really wouldn't be nearly as strong as we are. We'd only be a fraction of it. Just a few few people in Sacramento and doing writing letters and that kind of thing is nothing compared to what the chapters all over the state do. So the feeling is mutual. Well, we appreciate your support. Yeah. And well, thank uh, you, everyone. Just just a uh, about next. Uh, we're still looking for the uh, finalizing the uh, presentation for next month so stay tuned to your email and and the website and uh, uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll we'll have something for you so we look forward to seeing you uh, next month again thanks for coming and uh, see you in a month thank you everyone it's been a pleasure